Okay, let's check out 11 through 14. I actually wanted 11 on that other video, but well, I ran out of time and the bell rang for another class to start. So I had to uh, stop precipitously. Okay, so this really should have been part of the previous video because it has all to do with our good old friend trigonometry and some unit circle and all that stuff. But we have a really unfortunate thing that popped in right here where we've got a sine and a cosine, unlike the previous problem where it was all sines all the time when we had some nice little match. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a little blast from the past. And we want to remember we had this thing called a Pythagorean identity, which claimed that the sine squared plus the cosine squared is one. And keep in mind theta, the Greek symbol theta or x, are really equivalent ideas. I like this one better because this does emphasize the fact that X is an angle as opposed to some other kind of um, less symbolic thing. So what I'm gonna do is in order to make these two things match, I'm gonna replace this sine squared right here with a one minus cosine squared. And I will choose to use the X to match the previous problem. Now I just got um, a little bit better in this problem because now at least we have some simplistic agreement where it's all cosines where this one was all sines. Now a quick little bit of manipulation here. We got negative two cosine squareds. I've got a negative cosine. I've got a two here, but I lost one here. Uh, personally, I absolutely hate it when we're in that situation where the leading coefficient is negative. So I'm going to go ahead and divide everybody by a negative um, because that's not going to change the answer at all. Um, notice it's not an inequality, so I don't have to change signs. So we're going to go ahead and factor one more time. Two is a prime number, so really we can only achieve that with a two cosine and a cosine. One is also not prime, but it's obviously pretty unique. We can only get there with ones. And so we got a two cosine squared, we got a one, but somebody is negative. So a two and a one, two cosine and a one cosine would be positive if the two cosine was positive and that's negative. Now this brings me right back to the unit circle because this solution, just like this one where the sine was negative one half, this is gonna be happening where the cosine is positive one half or where the cosine is negative one. Problem is a little different than the previous one. This one had no solution to the second portion of this one, but this one does have a solution. So keep in mind on the unit circle, the X value, on the unit circle. That's one reason I like theta better because I'm using X in a different way here. But the X value is negative on a cosine straight to the left. That angle is pi. So one of the values that would make that true, and in fact, the only time on the entire unit circle where the X value is negative one is at the angle pi or 180 degrees. Right here, remember we did use our little mnemonic device that the cosine is positive in both of these two locations and the cosine is one half of pi over three. And I would love to just say negative pi over three because that would be the most efficient, but this doesn't allow me to do so. So I need to rotate forward. So one pi over three is here, two is here, four pi over three, and this one right here is five pi over three. So the three locations that that actually happens is right there. Now, one of the nice things that you can do if you are taking a test or not being totally clear about what you're doing, is we can take out a graphing calculator or a Desmos thing and just look at some stuff. So I'm gonna ch check out my mode, go to radian. I'm gonna tell it to do zero to two pi because the problem told me to do that. I also know that sine waves and cosine waves oscillate between one and negative one, but there are some extra little goodies in here. So it may go a little higher and a little lower. So I'm gonna give myself a little bit of range to allow it to wiggle because we've got some more. And so what I want to do is I want to find when is 2 sine squared. Notice that I had to put a parenthesis and make sure it took all of the sine and then squared it, minus the cosine and minus 1. And I want to find out when is that equal to 0. So let's take a look at the graph. And one thing that you're going to notice is there's one place that hit 0, a second place that it hit 0, and a final place. So I got three answers in my other, and I see three answers here. This is very, very much on purpose. You'll notice some symmetry to the curve. That's actually a very good thing. But if we calculate, do blue trace, 
I can find the zero. <coughs> this is going to ask me to move my cursor to the left of that first zero. Move it to the right of that first zero. You'll notice it put an arrow when I hit the first one. When I hit the second one, it says, oh, my answers are in here. And I say, now go get it. And it came up with this number 1.407196. Okay, this big obnoxious number, which you would probably guess would be this number because it's the shortest of all the three. But one nice thing that you can do is if you quit from here and you take the answer, which is second negative, that's the answer. And the last thing my calculator found was that zero. And if I divided that by pi, because pi is an irrational number, so I wanted to get that out of there and hit math, enter, enter. It's going to take that number, it removed the pi from it, and it yielded the fraction one third, put the pi back in because it really belonged. It was part of the answer. Or you could also say, well, I know what decimal I saw was pi over three that decimal. That's another way to look. So we've got a couple of ways to look at that. Now, we're going to move on, boy, almost like what a crazy thing to go from all these problems about trig to dealing with logs and exponents. So right here, if you are going to solve a logarithm problem, the first thing you want to do is just isolate that log. If you're solving a, a trig problem, isolate that ugly piece, that trig. So let's move the two across. Let's divide both sides by five, we're looking good. Keep in mind, one of the properties of logs is if you say the log base A of B is C, that means by definition that B is A, it doesn't look much like an A, B is A raised to the C power. So to take it out of a logarithmic expression and turn it in an exponential, you take the base, raise it to the answer, and that's equal to the value you were taking the log up. So keep in mind in this story, the base of the natural log system is e. So x minus two is e to the sixth, pop the two across, two plus e to the sixth. What a beautiful answer that is. So that would be the solution to that particular equation. Now, um, kind of want to just go out of order here because I feel like these kind of go together uh, a little bit. So what I notice is this almost looks like another um, quadratic because e to the x times e to the x is e to the 2x, you'd probably see the 12 and the 1 and guess appropriately the 4 and a 3 has that ramification because if you have a 4 and a 3, we could make it negative if we do this. And that's going to allow that solution if either one of these is 0. So keep in mind if e to the x plus 3 is 0, that means e to the x must be negative 3. I guess that is in entirely impossible. E to the x is a graph that looks like this. It never reaches negative three. It's not possible. E to the x can never be negative. It is always a positive number. So there's no solution to this piece of the problem. But will e to the x here equal four? Doing the same thing, just adding the four to the other side. Would it ever reach four? Well, obviously there is an answer. It's gonna reach that number. So I'm going to kind of do the opposite iteration of what I did over here and kind of turn it back in it. So that would mean that X is the ln of four, if you kind of follow that direction. So this is our answer to uh, problem 14. It's really just the reversal of this particular step right here. Okay. And our last problem is actually a much nicer question because you can see the nine and the three, they have something in common. They have that common base. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this nine and call it three squared. And I'm gonna call this one third three to the minus one. Now by doing that, I've turned these things into a common base, which makes them very easy to understand. So I've got three raised to the four X plus two is the same as three to the negative three X plus two. Because one of the nice things about exponents is powers of powers, which is what we're looking at here, multiply. And so if the bases match, then the powers have to match. So I'm just going to go ahead and do this. There's a fairly lengthy explanation as to why that's the case. Now, this really bothers people a little bit, but when we move the 3x to the other side, 
move the two to the other side, a lot of people are like, well, wait, what just happened? Well, seven X is zero. And the only number seven times that is, is zero. So that was a very unsatisfying answer that X is zero, but we could try it. Nine to the zero plus one is nine to the first, which is nine. Nine to the first is nine, no big deal. Over here, three zeros minus two is negative two. Well, if I take one third to the negative two, uh, the negative power flips it over. So that's one third becomes three to the positive two, which again is nine. Both of these sides are in fact nine. This one was nine to the first. This was three to the minus two. Those are actually equivalent values. That's the end of page one. I'll be back later for page two. All right, hope this helps. See ya.